Well, we're back into 1 Timothy, and in this video, we're looking at the first half of chapter 5, and the sermon that I preached on this section, I called The Family of God. If you are jumping in here at 1 Timothy 5, I encourage you to go and watch the earlier videos that will help you just to see what we've covered in this incredible letter so far, because when coming to a chapter like this, context is so, so important. I really do encourage you to just read through this passage a number of times just to familiarize yourself with what's happening in this text and spend some time praying, asking God to help you to understand his word and why exactly he inspired Paul to write down these details for Timothy, who is leading the church in Ephesus, why they needed to hear this back then, what difference this makes uh, in the light of the whole Bible story and how we should understand it for the church today. Now, as I said, context is so important when coming to a passage like this, because if you read these details about widows without thinking about uh, what's happened in the book and you just try and apply them directly to us today, you're going to get yourself into all sorts of trouble. So you need to hear statements that Paul makes, uh, like in chapter 1, verse 3, where he, he says he left Timothy in uh, the area in Ephesus so that he could command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. So there were false teachers coming in. That's important to know for this section. You need to keep in mind passages like 1 verse 15 and 2 verse uh, 3 and 4, where we see that salvation of sinners is at the forefront of why Paul wrote. He wanted this church to keep the gospel message of salvation through our Lord Jesus central in everything that they do. Then in chapter 3, verse 14 to 16, uh, we get uh, what many call Paul's kind of purpose statement. He's writing this so that they'll know how to conduct themselves in God's household, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So within the family of God, the church of the living God, Paul wanted them to hold up the truth that we see in verse uh, 15. They are the pillar and foundation of the truth, holding it up for the world to see. And it's truth that we see in verse 16 that's all about Jesus, what he came into the world to do. And Paul wanted them to hold that truth about salvation up high. And then the, what we see in chapters 4 all the way to chapter 6 is this overarching theme of godliness. In chapter 4, uh, he says, train yourself to be godly. In chapter 4, verse 7, he says, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value in all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So this idea of godliness is an overarching theme in chapters 4 uh, through chapter 5 here into chapter 6. And it's important to know all of that context so that you can understand better what is happening in this specific section. So now in these opening two verses, uh, Paul speaks about family in general, church family that is. Um, so within the church, we are the household of the living God, which we've seen in chapter three. And he says, treat, rebuke older men or do not rebuke older men harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with absolute purity. So there's this strong uh, family feel treating those within the household as family. He mentions uh, purity here um, and we've seen that already in uh, chapter 4 verse 12. If you have a look at uh, chapter 5 verse 22 again and this is very much in uh, the realm of, of moral purity, sexual conduct, uh, purity in, in those areas. When he's talking specifically about younger women here, we see here, sadly, some of the younger widows uh, weren't living with absolute purity. They were living lives uh, for pleasure uh, rather than living godly lives for God's glory. You see where he talks about uh, how to rebuke an older man. He's not saying you can't rebuke an older man. He's just saying when an older man needs rebuke, exhort him as if he were your father. And I think the idea there is just uh, be so careful of your tone. Uh, tone is so important in ministry. It's so important in the family. as one of the reasons why I often 
uh, urge people not to deal with issues uh, via a text message or a WhatsApp or an email because you can't hear tone in written text. So in dealing with issues, if you need to rebuke somebody, talk to them, exhort him as if you were your father. That is to encourage him to live in a way that's godly. And that's true for the brothers, uh, mothers, sisters. We want to encourage each other in this family to be living in a godly way. But then from verse 3 to 16, uh, Paul puts the focus specifically on widows. And you see throughout this section, um, it's very clear that he's focusing on this small subset of the, the family in general. Um, but he's got specific things to say to widows in particular, and particularly about how the church uh, look after or care for widows. And within this section, there is a repeated uh, phrase or refrain talking about the widows that just helps us to understand Paul's focus here, where he speaks about the widows who are really in need. Uh, in verse 3, again, he says, the widow who is really in need, in verse 5, and then right at the end, those widows who are really in need. And Paul wants this church to really care for those widows. They need support, they need help, they need to be honoured. But Paul is concerned that they do this in a way that is good for the whole family and that will actually help them as the pillar and foundation of the truth to hold up the truth. And it seems that in this church, some of the support that they were giving specifically to younger widows was actually hampering their witness. It was harming them rather than being helpful. Now, Paul, in the bigger section from the beginning of chapter 5, the second half of chapter 5, and then the beginning of chapter 6, he deals with uh, three different groups. And the first group here is the widows. Uh, the next one is uh, the elders. Uh, so not specifically only older men, but the elders in the church. And then in chapter 6 at the beginning, he talks about uh, slaves and masters. And in all of them, he uses this word honor. So give proper recognition, more literally honor. And we see it here uh, in verse 3. We'll see it again in verse 17, and then we see it in chapter 6, verse 1. Um, Paul is showing how to honor different groups within the church. This is all falls under what it means for us to live godly lives that hold up the truth. And it's all so that we will show that this salvation that Christ Jesus came into the world to win actually does something in our lives and transforms us to be a people who live godly lives for God's glory. When asking the question about why widows uh, at all, um, there, there is a lot in the Bible where we see God speaking about how his people should look after and defend the widows and how he will defend them if his people don't. So if you go and look at Exodus 22, uh, verse 22 to 24, or uh, Deuteronomy 10, verse 17 to 20, or 24, 19 to 21. Uh, you can go and look at uh, Psalm 68, verse 5, just to see how God speaks about widows. Um, Proverbs 15, verse 25, are just some of the Old Testament places, and there are many, many more. Um, we also see in the early days of the church, in Acts chapter 6, um, where they set aside the seven. Uh, so that the apostles can focus on the ministry of the word and prayer, but they set aside the seven in Act 6 who will look after the widows uh, within the church family. So the care of widows is a big thing. But interestingly, in this section, uh, we see just some of the things that Paul tells us that show that the younger widows were actually causing issues within the church. So he says that they were um, becoming idle. And not only were they idle, but they were busybodies uh, talking nonsense. Um, and if you, you look at that uh, phrase, talking nonsense, we, we see um, back in chapter 1 that the false teachers were also uh, talking meaningless talk. He used uh, back in chapter 1. 
and some of the parallels that we see between these younger widows and the false teachers are sadly quite stark. And where we see here in verse 15, where he says, in fact, uh, some have turned away, some have turned away to follow Satan. Um, the, the words here, turned away, are the same words that Paul uses in chapter 1, verse 6, to speak about the false teachers who have, have wandered away um, from the truth. And some of the other things he says, uh, they have broken their first pledge. Uh, I think a more helpful translation of that is they've abandoned their former faith. So the problem here is some of these widows were put on a list. Now, we don't know a huge amount of details about this list that Paul mentions, but it's clearly a list of those widows who the church will support. And these younger widows were put on that list and they were cared for really, really well, so well that they didn't actually need to work or support themselves. So they became idle and busybodies talking nonsense. And sadly, some of them turned away from the faith. They abandoned uh, their former faith. And the problem here is the younger widows were, were pledging themselves, saying, no, we will help and we'll serve in different ways within the body of believers. Um, but then Paul says, but when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus, they bring judgment on themselves. Why? Because they've abandoned their former faith. So it's not just that they want to marry, but actually... Uh, their, their sensual desires take over to such a degree that they actually turn away from the truth uh, about Christ Jesus who came into the world to save sinners and they, they turn uh, to follow Satan. So the support that this church were giving to the young widows was actually becoming detrimental to them. And so Paul counsels the young widows particularly to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Um, so this we've already seen in chapter 2, verse 15, where Paul spoke of the normal God-given roles that God has given to women. Um, and here he's saying, women, fulfill your roles in a way that is godly, in a way that holds up the truth, rejoicing in the salvation that is yours because of Jesus, rather than being busybodies, talking nonsense, spreading uh, things that ought not to be spread, um, actually fulfill your role as a godly woman. And in their culture, that was get married, have kids, manage your home. Um, the home was very much the, the center for where a woman would do her work. And so Paul is just saying, fulfill your role in a way that is godly. He says here they should manage their homes um, rather than going from house to house, uh, spreading nonsense. Um, this idea of just within the household um, or your own family, your own household, uh, is also just a repeated theme in the section. And Paul contrasts the, the idlers or the busybodies um, with widows who are actually known for good deeds. They're not busybodies. Uh, they are living in a godly way, characterized by good deeds. And those are the widows that Paul says the church should support. But even in that, there's important details that uh, we mustn't miss because we don't want the support of widows to be something that is a burden to the church which Paul says here, and not let the church be burdened. So the church is called to love and care for and support widows, but not in a way that will be a burden to them. And Paul says here, give these, the people these instructions, uh, more literally command these things. So this whole section, the command he's giving, it's not just random thoughts about how to care for widows. He's doing this for a very specific reason because there were a group of widows within uh, the widows in the church who were actually causing more problems um, than, than doing good within the church. But there are a group of widows within the church who really need support. 
these are those who are really in need. And again, we need to uh, be very careful looking at the details of what Paul tells us. And one of the very important things we see is that the first responsibility, primary responsibility for caring for widows is with their nuclear family, their direct uh, family. So he says here in verse 4, if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family. And so repaying their parents and grandparents for this is pleasing to God. So those who have people who need care within their own family, it's primarily their responsibility so that it won't be a burden to the church. Again, here he says, if a woman who's a believer has a widow in her care, she should continue to help them, not let the church be burdened with them, so that the church, the household of God, can help those widows who are really in need. So it's not just a free-for-all, the church is called to help absolutely every widow with all of their needs. He's saying, no, the first primary responsibility is with their family, but then there are those widows who are really in need, those widows who are left all alone. So they don't have um, a, a nuclear family who can care for them. But even there, Paul puts the spotlight. He says they're left all alone, but she's put her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. So she's a Christian. And I think that's also important. The church is care, called to care for uh, Christian widows. It's not just a free-for-all. Um, our focus needs to be those who are a part of the family of God. And verse 9 and 10 here uh, show that too. She's somebody who has proved to, be, to have lived a godly life. Um, she's an older lady who has been faithful to her husband. Um, has brought up her kids in a way that is godly, or she sought to do that. She's shown hospitality. She's washed the feet of the Lord's people. Um, that is a shorthand way of just saying uh, she's a self-sacrificial servant. She helps those in trouble and devoted to all kinds of good deeds. Uh, this is a woman who models godliness. And Paul is saying if that if there is a, a woman who is striving to live God's way for God's glory, a woman who's wanting to hold up this truth that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, uh, widows like that care for them, honor them, he says here. Um, and he says so that the church can help those widows. So she is a widow who um, helps those in trouble. That word is uh, cares for. And he's saying the church should then help them. Uh, care for them. Um, if they're in your own household, care for them. But if there's nobody else to care for them, then make sure that the church helps in caring for them. And verse 8 shows us that uh, this care for your own nuclear family is of the utmost importance uh, because anyone who does not provide for their relatives, especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever saying for a Christian not to care for their own family is a denial of the faith because we are those who have been cared for in the most extravagant way Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners like us to serve us and we should see it as a privilege that we get to love and support and serve and care for others who are within God's family and especially those who are in real need like widows if any woman who is a believer has widows in her care, she should continue to help them. This is a key way in which the family of God hold up the truth. So there's a real challenge in, in this for each of us as Christians. We need to evaluate, are there um, those in need, uh, widows in our own family? And I think in our context, we could um, stretch this a bit wider the elderly in our world are treated very similarly to how widows were treated back in those days. And we need to think, how are we loving and caring for um, our own family, repaying um, our parents and grandparents? For this is pleasing to God. And then as the church, if there are uh, widows like this, 
um, who have put their hope in God, they're really in need, and they're Christian widows who have proved their godliness by their Christian example, but they don't have anyone to love and care and support them, we as the church should step in and love and care and support them as best as we can. And in this way, we show that we are the household of the living God, holding up the truth. Um, it's a key way in which we hold up this truth that Jesus saves as we care deeply for every member of the family, even uh, the most vulnerable, uh, those widows who are, are left all alone. And they should never be left to feel alone. The family of God should come alongside them, love them, support them, care for them, honor them. As the fifth commandment says, honor your father and mother. That honor doesn't end the day children leave the home. The honor continues even into the parents' old age. Uh, we should honor them well as we seek to hold high the truth of what our Lord Jesus has done and achieved for us. We don't want to care in a way that actually uh, turns people away from the truth. So we don't want to care for people that's going to cause them uh, then to become idle and busybodies talking nonsense and actually turning away from the truth. We want to care for those who are truly Christian, um, who are showing godliness by the way that they live. But within our own family, in your own nuclear family, then it's not only the Christians. We should be caring really well for the non-Christian uh, parents, grandparents, uh, widows, those in need within our own family, because in that way, we're also holding up and holding out the truth to them, showing them that we truly care. And let's be praying that that care for them would point them uh, to our Lord Jesus, that we would have opportunities to speak of why we live the way that we live, as we hold up this truth of what Jesus has done for us. And so as we read this section, as I said, context is so important. We can't read this divorced from the rest of 1 Timothy. But as we read it in the light of the whole of 1 Timothy, we see how all of this falls in to what it looks like to live as saved people, godly lives, holding up the truth, all for God's glory. And I pray that as you dig in further, that uh, your own heart would be challenged where there are opportunities for you to care in your own nuclear family and in the church family where you have opportunity to care for others. Well, God bless as you dig in further.